next on with the show. Here's Josh. Hey, we're going to start with uh, someone who has to leave at 545. We're going to start with Leslie Prosterman, and I'm going to look for her name, and then I'm going to unmute her. All right. Um, happy New Year, everybody. Great to be here. Um, I have three short poems under three minutes. The first one is called Solstice Tuo Tuo. The comfort of dark draws to a close. Whereas before, everyone knew that everyone stayed in, wrapped in the shadows. After, some will emerge. Others will draw knives. Numbers will keep to their caves. The uncounted dead, inseparable from many of us resting in our beds. Trembling, both from the strafe of the helicopters and of the lengthening dawn. They say this won't be the last one. Okay. Yeah. The next one is called New Decade. Before it was too late, she stored her flesh within the nebula, carmine rinsed to remind her of the inside hours of the corpse. She requisitioned steel talons, kept the shine because it tickled her, then rethought the project and retrieved her sweetheart hologrammed, multiply ready for the long night's work ahead. Thank you. And finally, salutations. When you encounter a traveler on the path, greet them not because she may be a god in disguise, not because she will give you a fistful of magic beans, nor because he will turn into your lost grandmother and reveal some arcane but homely wisdom, but because it is in your power to give a beneficence, because the Chinese red blossoms of this aloe plant are full of hummingbirds, and there is a fly on the window trying to join them. Thank you. That was beautiful. Now we're gonna to go to Austin Alexis, and I'm gonna unmute him. But I just unmuted myself. Very good. Okay. Read your poems and have a great time. Okay. Two poems. Ooh. It should come in under three minutes. The Strand. It stretches across five floor tiles. Brown strand against the white enamel, resembling a river photographed from a satellite. Calling to mind the ghost of a long dead snake, I recognize it is somebody's hair, belongs in a lustrous mane. But whose head did it fall from? Probably unnoticed. My hair grows shorter and a bit thicker than this wisp. I own no wigs nor pets. I live alone and socialize outside in restaurants, clubs, museums. Not even a repairman has disturbed the cloister I've made of my home. A line, delicate as the rim of a seraphim's finger in Titian, is what this tendril is. A tease left behind by a quiet, extraterrestrial, maybe, who snoops around my apartment as I snore the night away. Occasionally, other mystery hairs have appeared on my pristine bathroom floor. They are stray clues to something. I am a wide-eyed detective 
Life is a series of cold cases, whether we are tired of the missing pieces or invigorated by the cryptic. Weekly, even daily, we find hair unaccounted, unaccounted for, enigmatic, easy to step over, yet demanding to be seen. And frozen, an ugly dog, his coat matted, stranded on a semi-frozen river, needing saving from the river's cold, rescue from thinning ice. A snot-nosed mutt imprisoned in the beauty it yearned to cross and tested, intrigued by the gleam of blue-white expanse, all that hillless horizontal space, a man treading the ice as chunks break away from chunks, like bureau drawers opening, energetic yawns of nature, a man risking his existence to save the life of a dog he has never before encountered in this area he calls home, a collie searching for safety Savvy enough to know the ice is pretty, but dangerous. It's staccato crackling a warning sign. The man failing to understand why he is tempting death to shield the dog from death, only knowing he is doing what he is doing for a reason beyond reason. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, the way it is, I look on everyone's screen and when I call your name, you can unmute yourself and then naturally mute yourself when you finish. We're going now to Eddie Armour Mirando. That's Eridondo, Edward, yes, that's me. Okay, I'm unmuted, may I begin? Proceed. Okay, th this is a monologue that I've written. It's from a, a play entitled, McDonald Drumps Christmas Carol. Christmas Eve, 2020, light on President Mc McDonald Trump, sleeping in bed, suddenly awakens from another nightmare about his father who died on Christmas Eve, 1999. In panic, he stands. Every night I wish I had not been born, so shorn of manly horn, deformed, a loser. If only I had been born with normal dick, never would I have shark down women in disgrace, filling the hole in my heart with pussy grabbing bait. My little shark fin hands took on a life of their own. Sharking randomly, compulsively grabbing pussy, a serial pussy grabber I had become. Sportively, I had become a collector of trophy women, a playboy with portfolio of fake seduction. My heart, cold as the gold leaf lattice round my golden bed, sad, self-hate, I turned outward. A vicious bite, a bloody fucking swipe. I became a full-fledged shark, unkind, vainglorious. What many people thought bad, I thought good. Sharking creditors from contractors to bankers, crazy bets with other people's money. I was the king of debt. I love debt. Daily douchebag rags raking in plenty of dough, pl plastering my beautiful Playboy mug on, on front page spreads, fake news about some dame or deal and shark teeth letters dripping red, causing all to gawk, the talk of talk radio, raiding, soaring, your dirty hands baking my fucking cake, the making of this bully from the outer borough of Queens, my tabloid name said only in fearful whispers, Sharky Math. Like a fairy tale people wanted so to believe, they knew I was a shark before they voted me in, that I would bite all who took me in. I still cannot believe all this happened. Somehow I got into this stupid big league mess. Somehow I was elected president. It's your fucking fault, the fucking stupid people. You voted me in. Now I struggle in the hole of Putin's quid pro quo, wiping clean billions in debt, Keeping secret, keeping secret that golden wet night. And for all my gals, dirty laundered cash. If only I conspired in a plot with fake news bots against this arch enemy, that nasty woman, crooked Hillary Clinton, and lift all sanctions on the quick, should I win? To this plot with Russian trolls and fake news bots, bots, I readily agreed, knowing summer hath a greater chance of suddenly turning into ice, then I shall so somehow win the presidency, something I never wanted. Fame and money, the only reason. Bright lights, drunk tower, Moscow. Never treason. What awaits me now, I do not know. Can only dread. 
in my fleeting sleep too, too clear, sharpening of the knives I hear. Now the sudden onset of this not so paranoid fear that dioxin will somehow be secreted into my food. Putin's poison I cannot bear, causing lesions to my beautiful face, the falling away of my Aryan hair, the death of my playboy image, the death of me, that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I avoid Putin's dirty blend of dioxin poison by only eating cheeseburgers, KFC, and taco hell in bed. I love the Mexican people and they love me. Stocks booming, re-election assured, but for the appearance of the plague. A hoax, I say, over and over and over again, Car coronavirus is a hoax, only for the people who believe the lies of the liar. The liar never believes his lies. Near my bed, a ventilator, secretly my greatest fear. Near my bed, a ventilator. The light, it turns blue. I spike feverish, forehead hot, dry, rough cough. Infected by the screams of suckers and losers, they so want to kiss me and hug. My stupid supporters, screaming droplets of warm spittle wafting in the air. On this Christmas Eve 2020, many people want me dead. I will never concede. I won by a lot. I call for the red states to secede. I will be president for life of the red states of America in my tower, government in exile, broadcast live 24 seven on drunk TV. I wonder, the dead, the dead, do they cough in their graves? I hear in my head, these call their dead, coughing in my head. I see the dead in their graves, eyes and mouths open, coughing in my head, these, these COVID dead, these rattling chains, clanging, hoaxing my head, rattling, clanging, heavy chains in my head, hoaxing, who is there, who is there? Enter ghost of old man Trump, ask me who I was. Thank you. Thank you, that was a beautiful long poem. That's that's three minutes, and you did great. We're going on now to Bremner. Are you there, Ron Bremner? Unmute yourself. I am here. Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me to this wonderful uh, event. Uh, I wrote my best poetry 40 years ago, and uh, here's something from that period. Uh, this is from 1978. It's called Adeste Fidelis. Let there be cold light in this breath-starved night. Let the shadows retract until the final act, for all must appear right. Let there be barren words cast upon the dust-gathering hordes. Let the mad author slip away in his mystery ship. Out of this smothered heaven's sight. Let the lush curtains on this weathered hall. And all will be dazed. And for my second and final piece, I'd like to do something more recent uh, from my book. This is uh, absurdist. Oh, Hermit was so chronical of his mamas. His papas and strange young girls left with a star man who plays Debussy when you are near. When the sun went down on forever afternoon, a small circle of friends took money or a story to Coconut Grove and hung out with some fun and tuneful femmes with a kaleidoscope who had a pulsating dream of where the action is. Bill Bailey came home to Georgia to cotton pickers who looked so good in 66 when they still had Moss Canada. Something tender and sweet went out to lunch with Senior Soul and his loco cascades. The abominable snowman and his sister Kate sought a bow-legged man who could bring them freedom but all they got was Nigerian high life. So they shouted and took a nap. The crossroads of modernism is what makes the world unforgettable for Flatfoot Sam, who went in a frenzy to New Orleans all by himself. Thank you very much and have a happy new year. Thank you, Ron. Uh, 1994, I went to uh, New Orleans all by myself and I wrote a story and some great poems. Coming up now, we have Dorothy Cantwell. Dorothy. And I'm here also, Joshua. 
Repeat that. Paul Beckman. I was hitting the wrong thing. Okay, uh, Paul. Paul Beckman. Okay. Am I waiting or going? Oh, uh, you're in. The spotlight's on you, Paul. Contraband. The nightmare man arrives again while I'm still awake. Guard bangs on my cell door and I heft myself out of my bed and waddle my obese body in a fat man's walk over to the metal sink hanging off the wall. He unlocks the door and enters. I no longer have the temptation to look and see him, but I wait for him to smack me in the butt with his nightstick. And then I drop my underwear and lean over the sink, legs spread, hands intertwined, head resting on my arms. I hear the snap of his rubber gloves left on from his last cell visits and try not to tighten up. He probes my anus deep and rough, looking for something he thinks I'm hiding there. He finishes my humiliation and I remain in position while he tosses my cell, trying to find the drugs that someone ratted me out for. He flips my mattress, shines his high intensity flash around, rustles through my desk drawer, knocks over my books, and checks inside my shoes and clothing. Guard whacks the back of my leg and I stand up and turn around, facing him, but staring down at his shows, shoes, never lifting my head or eyes. He speaks and it's the same as always. Where is it? This can end. I remain rigid and silent, head down, shorts around my ankles. I feel the sting of the nightstick on my arm, even before he swings it. And then I turn and reassume the sink position. I've learned the moves well. The nightmare, nightmare ends, not with the relocking of the cell, but with the sound of his heavy boots walking down the hallway towards the next humiliation. I push myself upright and then bend down and pull up my underwear. Back in my bed, I reach under my overhang, my mud flap, and feel my high scotch tape deep up in the folds of my skin. I slowly pry it open while I'm facing the wall. I reach into the brown powder with my thumb and snort what I extract with my nail. I do it again for the other nostril and then quickly retape before it hits me hard, good and hard, and I fall back into what passes for sleep. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Now we're going to Dorothy Cantwell. Dorothy, unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. And thank you for doing this. Happy New Year. I have two, um, I think two poems, uh, short ones. Um, the first one is called Nautical Twilight. And Nautical Twilight is the time when the sun has just gone below the horizon and still illuminates the sky. Nautical Twilight. In mid-September, the sun no longer sets on the horizon, but behind a bank of trees reaching out from the island, feathery silhouettes against the evening sky. In this, the blue hour, its light sets afire the sails of boats, little floating flames against an iridescent cerulean sky. As you, my darling, my wanderer, slowly return to the encircling harbor of my arms as the sky darkens. Your birth waits as you make your way home after gales have blown you off course, storms have shredded your beautiful sails and mutinies have broken your heart. I mourn the others for whom no port waits, unmoored in a wilderness of ocean haunted by ghosts who breathe the air of dying and decay and the stench of their own perished hopes. And then um, I have one uh, called, After Leaving Verkovenia. After leaving Verkovenia, the jukebox silent behind us, we would linger outside on that fragrant nearby corner Nameless bakers baked until dawn, you showed me to tap on the window, 
push a dollar through the grate for a fresh loaf of golden bread. We lingered still, tearing hot pieces of semolina, steam rising in the cool, moist air. I always wanted the night to last just a little longer. I always wanted you to pull me toward you and kiss me as morning trucks clattered along cobblestones, signaling the start of a new day, a hint of dawn glowing to the east over the stark rooftops. Thank you. Happy New Year, everybody. That was beautiful. When the master poets from the past would give you a nice, strong hug. With a lot of information and great poetry, Barb Neiman. Information. At this point in the plot, she twists her ankle. He watches the owls. The car runs out of gas. At this point in the plot, the railroad tracks curve out of sight. The notices posted on the power pole take on a new meaning. The dogs cry like babies. At this point, the trees become an exception. The room a mistake that gives them hope. At this point, they are taught the truth about the sky. Information. Confuses Adam and Eve with Dick and Jane. Confuses Santa Claus with God and the tree with a loving uncle. Confuses the sky with the ocean they are afraid to wade in. Confuses the fingers they count on with the explanation for goulash. And one last one. Information. It is about the experience that it gives you. That is its meaning. The mailbox filled with popcorn is no more than that. It is the reason there are pockets. The reason that you are able to find a voice in the forest, in the ocean, in the animal that is always silent. The reason there is counting long after there is nothing more to count. Thanks. Thank you, Bob. And I hope these three people are in the house. The next person will be Anne Harindine, followed by Eleni Corti, and after that will be Linda Lerner. Uh, Anne Harindine, are you in the house? If you are, unmute yourself. I'm here, Anne Harindine. Harindine. Thank, thank you. This is from my novel in progress called The Anger Bomb. A long table with medieval food, whole animals and birds, lobsters, crabs and flatfishes, quivering molded jellies with bits of meat or fruit inside, pies and cakes and breads, vegetables stewed into casseroles, sauces and gravy and soups. The people stuff their mouths using their hands even though there are utensils. They're so ravenous they can't limit themselves to a spoonful, to what can be speared by a fork or sliced with a knife, tearing off gobbets of meat with their teeth sucking flesh out of shells, grabbing fistfuls of mincemeat and noodles and shoving them in, into mouths already full so that half of it spills out. Their chins are shiny with the slime of bits of every kind of food, plus saliva and phlegm. I stand in front of this panorama of gluttony, thin, starved, so weak I can barely stay upright, clutching a corner of the table. I'm hungry, I say. They stare at me, never stopping the grabbing and cramming, trying to chew and swallow faster so they can fit more in, globs dribbling out onto the table. Sometimes they choke, masticated food spewing out, and they snatch it back and push it in again. Hungry? Nonsense. What would you do with food? The taste, I say. I want the taste and the feel of it in my mouth, the pleasure. What pleasure, they say. I'm only eating because I have to. It's so tedious, a chore. Be grateful you manage without it. They hunt along the table for dishes untasted, pull lumps of mashed potatoes and gravy from their stringy hair and slobber their tongues over their hands. Ugh, how tiresome. I reach toward the detritus at the far edge, a scrap of chicken skin, an artichoke leaf with the flesh scraped off, a peach pit with some dry red ropes of flesh clinging in the crevices. Someone grabs me from behind, pulls me away. I'm still holding the chicken skin 
and I try to eat it before they put me back in my cell, but my mouth can't open. It's a doll's mouth, rigid pink plastic lips with a small round hole where a bottle can ejaculate formula into me. I weep and cry, strangled sounds, a baleen whale's vocalizations. They give me the mouse cage bottle of slurry, the sawdust and sand mixed with the minimum of nutrients to keep me alive, crippled by scurvy and rickets. I insert the metal tube like a straw in my mouth hole and start to suck. Thank you. Are you gonna do another one or that was it? Uh, that was it. Okay, excellent. Uh, if you're in the house, let me pronounce it correctly. Eleni Corti, are you in the house? I'm here. Excellent, you're up. You can hear me, okay? Perfectly. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, I have a couple of COVID poems. Uh, this one is called, And She Lived On Until Her Nails Turned Blue. I've lived many lives, lucky me. This is my COVID period. Might be the last, the last of the periods, like the Chinese dynasties, or similar, or forget it. I have my period. It's dynastic, sick really. But then again, all other periods could have been the last ones. I just got lucky for a while, was granted reprieve and went on to the new one, to the new me. This COVID me or not, too much flab around the waist, an attractive boyfriend a jerk for the first time, or perhaps at each period or dynasty from Ming to mindfuck. New boyfriend at each period, bloody mess and tyrannical lords of war. The first one. Uh, I am not a Christian or any other. I just believe in the spirits of the woods. Though the woods are gone, it is the moment to really believe in them. Though the springs are polluted, the nymphs could still reappear dancing at riverbanks. Though the ocean is consumed by plastic, I believe in mermaids. It is the moment to believe. Not to some old man in the sky or prophet or any other similar contraption or any man from above or any man. I do believe in satyrs though, running down the now barren hills. Thank God there are still some dicks around. That was so touching. William Butler Yeats, if he was alive, he would kiss your hand. Oh, thank you so much. That's sweet. Um, nope. I have time to do another small one because I, I, I have another yeah, small short one. one. Feel free, do a short one, go ahead. Okay. Fuck COVID, he said. Or rather, who fucks COVID? Probably you, I wanted to say. Though he had fucked me too, eight years ago, and still hadn't forgotten it. Fuck COVID, he said. It's not real. I'm getting on a plane. And so he left. He'll wait for me on the other side of the ocean to fuck me eight years later. Fuck COVID and fuck me too. <laughs> That's it. All right, uh, mute yourself. Coming up now is Linda Lerner. Can you hear me? You can't, can you hear me? Yes, we can, clear. Oh, okay. I recorded this because as you can tell, my voice isn't always good these days. Um, it's really one and a half poems. It's, the second one is a found poem and very short. Okay. I, think. And I hope it's. Okay. I'm waiting for this. Okay. To um, two poems. Thoughts of my father at the Brooklyn Museum. Stumbling onto a road, war prison is walked in 19th century Russia in my attempt to escape 
from a nine-month imprisonment in 2020 led me from dark, clouded, volcanic scenes erupting to a snow-blinding blizzard in my father's birthplace. The cold seeped into me as I stood transfixed before moving on to where a group of prisoners huddled together in a refuge of sorts, snow cascading down from a broken skylight, and thought of my father at 17, forced to join a group of youths marching on a similar road a century later to escape from pogroms. That universal cold I carried home with me, passing blocks of people shivering outside cafes and restaurants, leaving warm apartments to sit here a safe distance apart in huddling proximity of others I now join. The next poem is one of those that just, um, it's a five-line poem that just flashed into my head in a way, I guess a found poem. A shot heard. A horse-driven midnight ride in 1775 shadows planes and trucks traveling day and night to deliver a shot heard round the world once again this day, 12-14-2020. Thank you. Have a happy new year. And I'd like to thank the hosts, Josh, Linda, who did an amazing job, and the um, and Roxanne. It's been really nice to have this to look forward to, to spend way to spend New Year's Day. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Your your poems were so vivid and imaginatory, and had a lot of history. You know, thank history, you. Uh, history, uh, history references in it. And it's very profound. The next readers are going to be uh, Noah Levin, Ellen Lytle, and Big Mike. So Noah, please come on up. Un unmute yourself. Hi, all. All right, so I'm going to read one piece. This is called Fairy Tale of Reality. Pages told as childhood goes, imagination was adrift. Forever tomorrow, like eternal timeline drawn in sand. Dared across attitude, the only challenge to face. Fairy tale reality was truth and future. Possibilities roamed free as mind, but the clock ticked and secretly stole from flesh. Clock bleeds with each stroke, his crush of hand became harder to bear. Chapter piled upon chapter, but wish yeah. a dream could still be reality as mind still sailed on open sea. Tick tock goes mind. Tick, tick, tick. Tick goes wasted effort. Top goes more to dream. Onward, onward. But the hand on the clock welcomed in new reality. Stronger reality as bled dreams fell from clock. Pages ripped asunder, floating in sea of lost dreams, slowly dripping, dripping. The wheel of reality crushed mind. Gears grind, clock ticks, system in place. The book was a lie. Reality was set in stone and ambition adrift. The clock bleeds until sea of dreams claims soul and ship of hope is fool's way out. Book under arm, book held high. Staring at clock, I see it was created by a thousand minds. Shriveled thoughts imagined into reality. Ticking together, nightmares born to regulate and steal souls to keep mass weathered flesh together. Arms were, pace set in stone, movement still forward, eyesight stolen, gray is the only normality, wither and flesh, wither in mind, clockwork patter, it was all still written, soul sucked into time construct to strengthen the dreary many, take pace, time lags behind and march down, march down road conquering high, a shout is heard, all hands to the ship, control the wheel, set course, set sail, set mind, set depth, set heels in place, mutiny your own destiny, Sail on through the clock. Shatter the arms in myriad parts until shattered gears stand at odds. The parts lay in waste and tick tock will not wince. Chapters still pile high, weighing down a sharpened mind creates new weave. Supposed ship adrift is now at helm and book under arm remains guide to dreams. Sail on now with clock in proper places, northern star and sky above and withered mind no longer told to pay. Sail on, sail on. 
thank you all very much. Thank you, and Noah. Happy New Year to everybody. That was great. It is time now for Ellen Lytle. Ellen, unmute yourself and uh, give Um okay, it says Michael Lytle on it. <laughs> That's my this is my husband's uh set up here. Anyway, happy new year. It, I'm much more nervous than usual, which is pretty bad. So just because we're all together on this little panorama and I really like it. And thanks to Linda, she did just an incredible job and everyone else. They all talk of leaving New York. In Pocan, Chile, Viña del Mar, Chile, 5,099 miles away, there's a lonely church whitewashed against blood. There's, what did you do here? Because there's some sort of echo. I'm sorry. You sound just fine. Yeah, well, my husband distorted something. <laughs> okay. Okay. There's a lonely church whitewashed against blood red hills, just scraping by at sunset. Yet the way afternoon sun is pitched right now, New York City becomes a beach with an oversized viral elephant in every room. One that leers behind a rose bush or thatched house, but discontent doesn't trade your window garden with easily potted plants for those glossy magazine flats. Not the way this light dolls up the assorted greens or the way the electric fan blows a breeze across the room while you hug the big chair pillow and focus on Chansey watching the birds day after day fly up and away. Post haste from the windows. Does he mind, you wonder, if they don't come back? And um, I was going to do another one. Um, one day in early April, we all know what that was like in New York City, when everything was closed, just everything. The city sleeps, it's called a king's robe. The city sleeps in a vacant April in front of me. Hunched clouds are ribboning across an otherwise simple sky and the air. The air, shiny as diamonds, bewitches, pushing the day to dance, to pulsate with strollers and bikers, shoppers which look almost alive enough to animate, though I imagine twisting its rigid neck until it bursts, bursts its straits. Then, no matter what lies ahead, at 3 p.m., it's a king's robe that carpets the streets. But trip me if you can. I'm sick pressing on about this pandemic whose days pulled by skeins of rope are cinched at the waist, then slagged like a pair of dead legs into a night the world locked up. So earth eaten from outside in a painting settles the blight just behind a working mind, deleting all human want in a warm bathtub. Thanks. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. I think it, nobody heard me, Mike. Yeah, mute yourself, please. Okay. 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 Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, let it rip. Big Mike, unmute yourself. Recently caught an airing of the iconic 1974 film, The Night Porter, with Dirk Bogart and Charlotte Rampling on the TCM cable channel. A motion picture that was the inspiration for the Madonna video, Justify My Love, and also the sex club orgy scene in Stanley Kubrick's final picture, Eyes Wide Shut, which involved a reunion between a former Nazi death camp prisoner and the SS Waffen doctor who tortured and seduced her during her captivity years earlier in the midst of the Second World War. The iconic scene pirated by Madonna in her video depicts the younger version of Charlotte Rampling as a girl entertaining the prison guards in a makeshift cabaret, singing a Germanic torch song for Nazi tormentors, topless, 
her painfully emaciated rib cage, her tiny breast and erect pink nipple bared, wearing a cast off oversized ill fitting pair of German army trousers with suspenders, her close cropped hair hidden beneath a black SS officer's cap, her elbow length black leather gloves, all accentuating her boyish figure, dancing barefoot for her captors like the seductive biblical child whore Salome. And just as King Herod in the New Testament, her king, Dirk Bogard, presents her with the severed head of John the Baptist at the conclusion of her performance. Hobbling on my pair of aluminum canes through Union Square Park, during a recent rainstorm at the very tail end of Hurricane Delta, I crossed paths with an unlikely pair of skate rats sitting together on a wooden bench in the drizzling downpour, initially mistaking them for a mother and son couple or older sister and much younger brother. As I continued hobbling by them, I realized they were truly a couple, school-aged friends, possibly even young girlfriend and boyfriend. My initial mistake was caused by their widely disparate heights. The dark-haired boy in the baseball cap was fully a foot or more shorter than his companion. The girl easily towered over him at six feet or taller. She was loosely clothed in an oversized, loose, ill-fitting gray hoodie and an equally ill-fitting pair of retro baggy bell bottoms, the cuffs dragging the damp puddles at her feet. As I passed by her, she momentarily broke off her conversation with her friend to brush back her long, ratty, rain-soaked, stormy blonde hair from off of her painfully thin face to gaze up at me, then purposefully making concerted eye contact before returning just as quickly to her previous conversation with her young paramour. Not thinking much of it at the moment, I continued down the east path to take a seat on a wooden bench further inside the park beneath the sheltering boughs of a honey locust tree to avoid the rainfall. Minutes later, the unusual young couple sauntered past me, each carrying their treasured skateboard, their divergent heights further accentuated now that they were both standing up. And just as our paths crossed, she once again brushed her long, ratty, strawberry blonde hair away from her pale, white, waved face. Again, make a concerted effort at eye contact as she walked by me. And for that brief millisecond, I felt as if I were her captor and she was my hostage and that I would readily have offered her the bloody, severed head of St. John the Baptist on a silver platter in appreciation, if only she would consent, just to dance barefoot for me in the rain. The end. Thank you. Big Mike, that was great. Uh, the next readers are Joseph O'Leary, David Olympio, and Rescue Poetics. Joseph O'Leary, unmute yourself and come on and give us a great poem. Hi, right, thanks, Joshua. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for putting this on. Uh, it's a really cool event, and it's uh, nice to be part of it. I put out a book uh, last month. I'm going to read some poems from it. I'll put the info in the chat if anyone's interested. This one is called I Went Down First Avenue. I went down First Avenue, ghost town. They get forgiven for Saturday morning for buses and rain. Even I got a reason not to do something. Oh, the sky was gray, the buildings gray, the road gray. I was running down the middle of the street, trying to lock my eyes to the 1.2 meters in front of me where they all meet. There are others around, sure, but not really. Really, there are no others. There are opportunities, but there are fewer of them. There is air, I take the air. This one is called Here on the Slope. Here on the slope is the start of the path to the waters of the kill. Sunday brings the kind of silence that gets broken and dusk butters it. Towels move, doors creak open, traffic leans into the intersection. The cat stares for long stretches at a spot of the wall. I curdle in the corner and signal the approach. I press buttons. The numbers go up and go down. Money goes everywhere. I keep an eye on the models, wait for the move that breaks the mirror, then take off. And this last one is called Come June. Come June, even the midnight sky carries a light residue. In the slate beyond, bodies move. No one knows why. They reflect each other, assist with their respective gifts. No one knows why. Many forevers passed first, 
but yes, they do part. Before that though, we point at regular intervals to the collections above and catch at the grass in awe. Two clouds pass with a click. Moonlight is sunlight, you say. I've been there. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, David Olympio, unmute yourself and give us your poems. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks. I'm going to also echo the thanks for hosting this and Happy New Year to everybody. Um, I'm uh, dialing in from Philadelphia. I'm not sure. Seems like most people are from New York, but um, I got uh, three poems today, and I guess they um, uh, might be considered ekphrastic. They're, to me, they're sort of persona poems. I put a link in the chat about about them, and I'm going to share my screen real quick because um, each of these have a po uh, photo to go with them. This one's called "These Are Written by My Dogs," and I know what you're thinking. I did get permission to um, to uh, write, read them. Um, uh, this is called "A Future Rewound." The bald man thinks we can mean something by the words we say, the ropes we shake. The hearts we break as if anything means anything at once today tomorrow and okay sometimes if i train the tracks of my thoughts real straight name the facts of my life notate each and every dream and seam in this tapestry of consciousness and waves sometimes then the leaves are only still sometimes then the effort less futile but despite all evidence of entropy, I piss on the arrow of time, leave the sun to senselessly shine, cuss the steady decline of us all. Meaning is only an excuse for being a passenger bound towards a future rewound, each moment a vast collection of thread ripped furiously from the same braided pull toy. This next one's called Again Eternally. I will make and have made around you these circles around you forever swam. I would do these times again and have done them again eternally, and I am not burdened. Neither this joy nor any sad we have together would I not together have again. This doing is neither the greatest weight nor the lightest nothing, but only this doing is. And there's a Nietzsche quote in that last poem. Um, and this last one's called We Are Together and We are together and ones who found fire together, chins held high together. We were together and spliced grass and ice, vice sliced open tied knots together. We woke together and went broke, bought time together, sought caught, climbed, and pined together. We rose together, yoked and smoked, cried together, stoked frozen skies together. We sank together, shrank apart, sleeping heart, tongue tied, not together. We flew together and moved through together, death and bones, reap sown and fell prone together. We are together and Thank you, everybody. Let me turn off the screen sharing. Sorry. Uh. How about John S. Hall? John S. Hall, unmute yourself and give us your poems. I'm here. Here I go. Um, I've written so far seven poems this year. I'll read the last five quickly. Poem number three, I am trying to decide about this anthology to which I submitted almost inadvertently earlier this week. I received an email with proofs of the poems I've submitted and they look fine, but the email also contained a link to some sort of legalistic document that bothered me because of the way it was drafted. I can get nitpicky sometimes, especially when asked to agree to something and especially when I am presented with a quasi legal document. I was this way long before I went to law school. I spent hours poring over my contract with Atlantic Records before signing it. I was grateful to have such a patient lawyer. I sent an email back pointing out that the word work went, was capitalized but not defined in the document and tried to explain why that was problematic. I also pointed out a few other issues I had with the document. Thus ensued an unfortunate back and forth that reached what for me felt like a head when I was told, I can assure you your poems don't warrant a full contract. This seemed unnecessarily hostile and insulting 
well, perhaps true, so I apologized, assuming that I must have said something to trigger such vitriol. The correspondence wound down soon thereafter, and I'm left wondering whether I am as uninterested in being in this anthology as its editor seems to be in including me in it. I guess I will wait until his next move. Poem number four, A Vaginal Wall, Clasping and Grasping a Pulsing Cock, an allegory of life, of love, of yin and yang, of all and everything, of timelessness and ecstasy, of the two as one, an ever so brief moment in infinite eternity. Poem number five. Every year for more than 25 years, I read, poem, I read poems in public on the first day of the year. Usually, usually I, uh, usually I read work I have written the previous year, but today, in a few hours, I will read from work writ written today, some or all of these, or maybe others yet to be written. It is good to have things to look forward to. Poem number six, I believe I am as full of gratitude on this New Year's Day as I have ever been on any New Year's Day. I am grateful for the people in my life who are close to me and for the people in my life who are not so close to me, but who are nevertheless in my life. And I am grateful for this world and these moments that I get to spend in it. I am grateful for the breaths that remind me that I am here, alive and breathing. I am grateful that the mind still comes up with things to say, things that never really seem to come to from me, or at least never seem really seem to come exclusively from me. Really, they don't seem they seem to barely come from me at all. And I am grateful that these words will reach some other people, that some of these words will touch or mean something to some people. I am grateful for the meaning that you might find, that I might find, that we might find, whoever you or I or we might be. Poem number seven. So far, no vulgar poems, no violent poems, nothing particularly transgressive. I'm not concerned. Before I know it, I will be literally, if not literally, if not literally, sucking and fucking, being sucked and getting fucked, contemplating and describing some violent or vulgar tableau, eyes may be gouged out, cocks cut off, balls abused, assholes stretched wide to accommodate God knows what. Okay, I don't want to be rude, but you definitely went over, and I tried to tell you, and I, I apologize if you feel offended, but everybody is supposed to read three minutes, so I played the heavy for one second. Coming up now is Kerry Trotman. Hi there. So I, um, I'm also not in New York. Um, David or whoever was in Philly. I'm in Ohio. I have two New Year's poems. This first one was written a couple years ago. It's called Janice. I leave the impending year to you and your forward face, your other looking to my past. Be kind. Avoid, for instance, winter storms with our tires slicking out from below us like a magician's trapdoor. Those deaths that sent me shuddering to the dark of my bedroom closet floor. Arguments like the one when I imagined leaping from the car to the ditch with its toads and nettles. Supposedly, we are not given more than we can handle. Still, bear in mind, our crib has been sold. I wouldn't know how to fight a man if he attacked, or worse, I might kill him. Our roof might not survive a blizzard, surely not tornadoes. And beneath it are seven bodies of bones, best unbroken, organs and egos in need of shielding. Keep my everything intact. Deliver words to my fingertips, sun heat to my tomato leaves, elbows to my kitchen table, whiskey to my lips. And this next one um, is new. It's called End of December 2020. There is a piece in replacing the calendar on the refrigerator front empty squares like sparrows beaks, the way a handbell choir and robed chorus ringing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel is more beautiful hearing it only once each year and in its darkest weeks. Earth spins away from one sheet music of stars but towards another. There will always be the choice to fill a gut with what nourishes or with rum-soaked fruitcake. The choice to see starlit snowfall as a mausoleum filled with ravens and irises in need of dividing, or as a canvas to paint a new garden. To hear white silence as suffocation, or as an inhalation awaiting a chorus to appear in a snowdrift, erupt in O oh Holy Night, fall on their knees. That's all. Thank you very much. That is beautiful. That would be great with a visual of someone walking in the snow and praying. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the next readers are Anik Van Prague, then Dick Wayne, followed by Hope Wiener. Anik, it's your turn. Unmute. All right. Um, I'm reading. Hold on. Am I? Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, your good. Hair, haircut, nice and wavy, and you're wearing glasses, and your voice sounds quite beautiful. Okay, though. I'm uh, reading one poem, but the two parts one is French, one is English. And it's called Shimmer of Light. Merci d'avoir permis de chanter dans le ténèbre, chambre sans mur. Merci pour une confiance très puissante. Nous entendons des mots d'amour, les coups de couteau dans mes yeux, les fusillades incapables de bouger contre nous, coupant les arbres jusqu'à ce qu'il n'y en reste plus, torturer les animaux et plus les manger, refusant d'entendre leurs cris. Merci alors que nous tournons un coin et par faire confiance, reconnaître dans une connexion multidimensionnel. C'est comme ça, on m'a dit, et voici un miratoiement scintillant dans mon cerveau. Je vois une herbe plus verte et plus douce, jonquille plus jaune que me souviens, vent plus dur que dur. Est-ce est espoir? Peut-être. Quelqu'un me tienne la main, je m'entendrai. Un appel, bonjour. Tu es là? Je pourrais être. And in English, thank you for allowing me to descend into darkness, chambers with no walls. Thank you for stumbling trust. We hear words of death, the stabbing in my eyes, the shootings, incapable of moving against. We cut trees until there are none left, torture animals and then eat them, refusing to hear the screams. Thank you as we turn a corner, not trusting, acknowledging in a multi-dimensional connection. This is the way I was told. Lo and behold, a shimmer, shimmering through my brain. I see greener, softer grass, daffodils more yellow than I remembered, wind sweeter than harsh, is this hope? Maybe. Someone holding my hand. Je m'entendrai. A call. Hello. Are you there? I could be. Thank you. Thank you. And your poem gives us all a shimmering hope for the new year. There Before you go. <laughs> okay, I'll just mute yourself now. Before we go to Dick Wayne and Hope Wiener, uh, Lydia Cortez was supposed to read early, but she wasn't in the house. So Lydia Cortez, unmute yourself and dazzle us with your poetry. Okay. I'm here. Uh, I'd like to thank Linda Kleinbub for having put this together and organized it with her helpers like Madeline, I know has been very uh, busy working on this also. And I'd like to thank Joshua for hosting this hour. Okay. Thanks, Lydia, for coming on this. Because as sure. you know, we were trying since September to have something like this. So thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. My pleasure to be here. Happy New Year. Fel Felicidades to everyone. Um, my it. This is so funny. This is so tragic. This is so, this is so, this is so it. This is it. This is so, 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 this is so, so, so. This is so missing, so something. This is so, 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 so needs salt, needs something. So, so, so means missing taste. Tastes like nothing, nothing tastes like no thing. So, 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 miha means you need to put some salt, put in some sal, 
in some sal, not sal like some Italian, but sal with a T and you'll get it salt, some salt, not just any old sal like Salvatore Mineo. Oh, my Salvatore means savior. Oh, mi Salvador in Spanish, Salvador. Salt goes gold, not Salvatore. Sal goes tower, except sal in Italian is sale, not sail in English, blackish Friday. Sal, a command in Spanish. Go get out in Spanish. Salt in Italian, salt in Italian, not go rogue. Oh, this is so something. This is now algo something. Not I'll go, but I shall go with I'll go with something. Something is not nothing. Something is not nothing. Something is not no thing. Something is something. Something is whatever. Whatever have you done? So said my mommy. My mommy said, what have you done now? Que cosa has hecho ahora? Has is not has, even though spelled the same. Oh, the spell of words. Oh, in English has an H. Oh, in Spanish has not. Ahora has an H. In it, in even though we don't say it like in English, it's not ahora. That sounds a little dirty, a little like an Israeli, or is it a Jewish dance? Oh, is it? Oh, is it? Oh, it's so, it. So, so it, it is it, or, thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. Thank you. Uh, my apologies for the next reader. I've never met him. Uh, his last name is Wayne and the, he goes by the name of Dig Wayne, right? So come on up, sir. That's correct, Dig Wayne. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, everyone. You can hear me, correct? We hear you okay. loud and clear. You've got a strong Very good. masculine voice. Thank you. I've been told that before. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm coming in from Los Angeles today. So I like to say, Carrie, I grew up in Ohio. And uh, I always say they should have had a bumper sticker in Ohio. It says, Ohio, nice place to leave. But, you know, <laughs> it's a great place to grow up. This first poem was called uh, Mr. Hard Ankle Blackson Jr. Uppity? No, sir, not me. Just looking you in the eye so as I can see. I'm bulletproof now. Watch me run. I ricochet off peace signs, armed without a gun. You mistook me for a man that swallows hard, dreams in color. I ain't a fear to you. Black like me, gray in the head, aging like time, won't catch me dead. I'm bulletproof now. You can't hurt me none. Barefoot on glass. I'm a hot dog without the bun. I'm gonna live to be 110, close my eyes and start all over again. I'm bulletproof now, living in the space age. I'll fuck up a locomotive like a Tetchy Lou cage. I'm bulletproof, baby. I ain't a fear to you. I done lived this long. What else am I gonna do? 2020 didn't kick my dick. All the love in the world won't make me sick. Mother nature, father time, birthed me up on New Year's Day. Glad that you're a friend of mine. I ain't a slave to hate on some poor folk's slate. Sister, brother, cousins, all raise up a cup to humanities. I'm bulletproof, baby, can't hurt me none. Got my arms around dear life, hugging up the sun. Warm and free, uppity, who me? Looking you in the eyes so I can see. Thank you. Mr. Hard Ankle Blackson Jr. This one's called Eternity by another name. The arrogance of time. Time has no competition. There is no opposite of time. There is either time or no time. The lack of something cannot really be the opposite. It is a negative, positively. People weighing seconds, calling, scaling minutes, counting hours, worried for our well being, grandmother clocks, if you will, ticking faces, making us believe time is real. It has a voice, making us think we can relate to time. If we hurry, we can cash out more than we deposit. Sometimes we get 30 minutes to the hour. Time will cheat you, man. 
seems like in any way. There are no deposits of time. You think you are saving time, but you'll only spend it elsewhere. It's not really saved. Try and put your saved time in the bank. We comfort ourselves with the notion that putting in time makes the result worth more than a hasty scribble. I am not so sure. Loss of time can never be found. Time cannot be lost like a curious child in a mall. Time cannot be found like a brown leather wallet on the sidewalk. You are running out of time, they say. Time is never up or down. Don't let them trick you into believing that time has a direction. The smallness of man requires time to be doled out like Halloween candy. We spend our lives with our hands held, like, held out like spooky children grasping for more time. Who wants all the time in the world? I do, I do, me, me. Who wants to spend their time wisely? I do, I do. Now you can afford to waste some time or believe you are saving time. Saving time from what? Time doesn't mind if it's wasted. It has forever and a day. Who gets the quality time? Me, you? There is no you in time, but there is I and me. I will take all the time I can get me. I will take my time until I'm good and ready. But time is not on your side. Time is tight. Time has no heart. Time will kick your ass time and time again. Time does not care about you. Time does not even know you exist. The only thing that kills you is life. What is life if not time? A blip in eternity is all the time you have. And I believe that's my time. Thank you. I think that was really cool. I can imagine a jazz trio playing with you, especially a snare drum. It was great. Thanks um, very much. You got it. Uh, mute yourself. Now we have the next three readers are going to be Hope Wiener, Susan Young, and Jack Zaffos. Hope Wiener, unmute yourself. Hi, this is so funny. I got confused about the time, so you're going to hear some outdoor noise because I was I'm outside. But hi, everybody, and happy New Year! And I've been loving your poems. Um, luckily, I'm just reading one. <laughs> Here we go. Let me just put it. New Year's wish. 1980, seventh grade, new girl, new school, mean school, new blood, new boys. First dance, I wore my glasses. I didn't know. I could. I wish I could remember what I used to wish for before the first dance. I wish I could remember when it, what it was like to just smile for a photo. After that dance, the seed of my lifelong wish was planted to meet him. Him, you know him. Unrequited, it felt like a growing wound. December 1st, 1980, Cosmopolitan Magazine catches my eye. There it was, an answer to my awkward girl dreams. 1981, outlined in a tiny insert. Aries, Cosmo said. Aries, you will meet him. 40 years to the date, and here I am, wrinkled now and no more blood, looking to Cosmo to see if he is coming. I know there are better things to wish for, but that wound still unhealed. I can't help myself. And that's it. <laughs> Short poem. Short and sweet, as they say. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Susan Young, a poet and a painter, and also a taiko drummer who was featured one time at Nomad Square. Susan, unmute yourself and give us your work. Uh, that was once upon a time taiko player. I'm not considered Japanese enough to play taiko. Anyway, um, this is a um, piece of writing. Since I'm in the Gowanus, Brooklyn, it's about Brooklyn. And I call it MacGuffin in the House. In 2016, 500 Gowanus artists out of 700 artists were evicted from Brooklyn's studio space on 9th Street and 2nd Avenue for the developer to refurbish with modern amenities catering to tech and media advertisers. There's a photo of city councilman Brad Lander who used these artists for his bridging Gowanus campaign during the construction of Lightstone on the canal, posing with the evicted artists. In Brooklyn's Fifth Avenue, south of Park Slope, Sixth Avenue, it used to be diverse in the 80s. Then Gentrify or Fifth Avenue Committee, led by Brad Lander, a community service program, replaced Bodegos, Cuchifritos, local drug stores, Kentucky Fried Chicken, discount stores, as well as displacing ethnics with boutiques. 
The only diversity is Iman House, a little storefront for fending leftover rent stabilized tenants and providing writers workshops for, write, for women of color. Now Fifth Avenue is renamed Park Slope and extends to Fourth Avenue with 20 story luxury apartments. Four years later, 2020, the mayor with city, council, city councilman Brad Lander are on rezoning campaign. Mayor de Blasio wants to rezone and displace Manhattan, Soho and NoHo artisans, small businesses for building contractors slash developers. Meanwhile, Brad Lander wants to relocate low income tenants in the most highly toxic five acre public land during the Guanas Canal Superfund. Brad says it'll be 100% low income housing and a new school facility. The MacGuffin is understood that peoples of color, homeless families, disabled and seniors are most qualifiable for low income housing. Is this another form to ghettoize and genocide a new community on highly toxic land? Do not believe politicians who are deaf, blind, and double talking to their constituents. Nothing is fair anymore. When will it ever end? Thank, Thank you, Susan. You tell it like it is. Mute yourself. And now we'll go into Jack Zaffos. After Jack is Joshua Meander. And then we're going to look into who's in the waiting list. So Thank Jack you. Zaffos, unmute yourself. Give us your poetry. This is called At Winter Angles. They were playing old music at a cafe with crooning voices and muted coronets, then that faded into violins. A string bass kept a gentle pace while a singer sang love songs as the hour was getting late. As the sun sank lower, shining through a window at winter angles, during a cold January afternoon. This is called The Grass Still Rises. The grass still rises piercing the concrete cover, the rock hard blanket. The grass rises blade by glade so very green. The grass still rises as does a tall tree, as does the faith of the angels that exhort each blade of grass. This is a time of much confusion, much sadness amidst smoky clouds of concealment. In the late night hours, I am exhausted. I am heartened to know the grass still rises. And this last poem I'll leave uh, is an exhortation for hope. It's called, It Is Upon Us. It is upon us to open up to what is around us and look again beyond the clouds of contention. It is upon us to find the spark of splendor ever present in the everyday. It is upon us to listen, listen again to the streams of life within you and the person beside you. It is upon us to find our fire and fire it forward to kindle the candles of community. It is upon us to look beyond self-made walls to make our contributions to peace. It is upon us to study justice, pursue it and speak it to power. There is no edict over our heads or a shackling command that binds us. We have free will but there is cause and effect and we all leave our mark. Reality's chain will have another link. The end will be, will the chain be strong or will, be, or will we will crumble from our own weight. Thank you. Thank you for that deep poetry. You yourself and now one poem from Joshua Meander, myself, and then we'll look into the uh, waiting list. The title of this poem, Con shall request your attention. In hollow of former dwelling, 
a hermit's emotions remain to be pushed out like notes. Let your firm hand press on the small opening and a sacred roar will rush out the spire to substitute for a bugle's announcement. Only being with large, long power, lungs can blow like windy day into a handheld cave. Each blast is a superior spirally warning to begin battle against demons. What dies is not the living, but the ideas. This is a request in lengthy ancestral howls. Large conch shell, a snail's vacant home. Now for jaded score to hoot throughout valley like music of the spheres. Oh. Um, All right, Michael Anton. Thank you very uh, much. Often perform. Thank you very much. This is Ho Ho Friggin Ho. Back in 2002. No, wait, what am I saying? It was 1992. Geez, time gets fluid as you start to get older. It was in 1992 that I and some like minded patriots decided to kill Santa Claus. Put a nice 45 caliber slug right between those merry, twinkly eyes. We'd been watching that fat fuck for some time. So I'm holding little children on his lap that were definitely not his grandkids. Guy was a perv and we were going to stop him. The plan was to fly to the North Pole and take care of business. We had an inside elf who was going to unlock the door for us. He felt he'd been shafted by the big guy and was looking for payback and a chance to take over the entire operation. We heard rumors of other elves who wanted to unionize the shop and of still others who wanted to turn it into a toy co-op sort of a from each according to ability, to each according to need sort of thing. That part wasn't any of our business. I'm only telling it to you so that you know that things weren't as they seemed up on top of the world. After dispatching Mr. Big, we were going to celebrate with a reindeer roast. If you've ever eaten and enjoyed venison, then you don't know what tasty is until you've had reindeer. And ain't nobody knows how to toast roast reindeer better than elves. First on the spit was gonna be that red state fascist Rudolph, and that nose so bright was gonna be the maraschino cherry on top of the dessert. I was drooling just thinking about it. So we're in the air heading north. Our pilot is a former Navy flyer, good guy, knew his stuff. And over Alaska, suddenly we're flanked by two F-14 jet fighters, and they make it pretty clear our choice is either to land in Nome or get shot out of the sky. Since you're hearing this, you can guess what we chose. Turns out one of our group was an FBI informant. He was looking at a long stretch for killing one of those bell ringing fake Santas that he suspected of giving his wife a little too much Christmas cheer, if you know what I mean. We're all arrested and I'm charged with conspiracy to commit murder. I'm looking at a possible 20 to 30 years. That's when the best criminal defense attorney enters the picture. Christ, this broad was amazing. In exchange for a guilty plea, I get 100 hours of community service to be carried out serving food at a homeless shelter. I can do this standing on my head, but for a few hundred smackaroos in cash each week to the director, I'm certified as having done my end of the deal. I'm free and clear now. And as for that red clothed obscenity up north, I'm retired. Somebody else will have to take him out. Thank you. Uh, okay, the first one we have Austin. Now, if Austin wants to read, you know, read a poem, Austin. You can unmute yourself. All right. Yeah. Sight. If you see something, say something, the sign silently saying. Do not detain your needed yells as you witness chokeholds squeezing windpipes to windlessness. Do not bind your hands with newfangled handcuffs behind your backs twisted where they'll rest on your asses useless. Do not gaze. Elsewhere, your eyes blank as Sandra Bland's when she was hung backstage in a crooked Texas jail by a perversion of order and law. Unloose the muzzles, rip off the blinders. Your stares should be sharper than the telescoped peering of Columbus who pretended not to see what he saw. Thank you. Well, 
without further ado, uh, Danny, come on up. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear, you got a nice smile. Good, um, happy new year everybody. I'm really happy to be part of this and I wanna thank Linda and everyone for putting to this together. Um, I wish everyone a much, much, much better 2021 <laughs> than the past year. Anyway, to the poem. This is a series of little poems called Autumn Sketches. What the dog walker said. Hoboken's like a cult. They sit in their cubicles all day, working, working, working. Then they turn into werewolves Thursday and Friday night. It's crazy. They sure like to party. Wonder how they'll vote. Late. On my walk today, I noticed a new Halloween superstar on the site of what had been Models. I wanted to go in, but as I got closer, I realized today is November 5th and the store is dark. Power. In this season of discontinence, I have discovered new powers. I can walk as far as my bladder allows. The soccer field, the boathouse, the train station, Sinatra Park, the financial center, between two parked cars on a deserted west side street. Branding. A line in front of City MD snakes around the corner. 50 feet away, a group of maskless men crowd around a sidewalk DV as the Jets lose once again. Across the street in front of McDonald's, a homeless man waits with empty paper cup in outstretched hand. The Trump motorcade drives down Washington Street, horns blaring, flags waving. Joy. Self-imposed rules of poetry be damned. I feel joy. Though I wish my sister Carol was alive for the election results, to see the dancing in the streets, the banging of pots and pans, Caroline and I stumble through town drunk on noontime champagne in this uncanny November sun. Report from my son. The bagel line was long. Jesus was out begging for change. Everyone looked hungover. Another Hoboken Sunday morning. That's it. Joseph O'Leary. Hey, uh, thanks again. Uh, cool. Uh, so this is another poem from my book. It's called, It Doesn't Show You Right Away. It doesn't show you right away, but stillness has its own inertia. Peace here becomes a parlor trick, a space between. Tonight, the shore is glass under a failed wave that calls for the heart. Pity and nostalgia tug. Bodies, horizons, immediacy. But border is a theory, nothing more. The end scene is never the real end. Points of view just cut it that way. And we see when the crawl terminates at abandon, a way to leave things off to the side, to ask of your eye, how will we know? How will we know when to finish? Thanks. And that was a great finish. Susan Young, unmute yourself and come up again. Pandemic, a blessing or not, for me, it forestalls an eviction practice from a stepfather and a stepson who inherits a building, my new landlord. Can I walk away? The rich are killing the poor pandemically. While watching Miss Marples on YouTube, a neighbor died today. The hearse drove away with a body on a gurney covered in a gray blanket. Rest in peace, Joe Mariano. Later, I watch Agatha Christie's Her Hercule Perot's Evil Under the Sun. To ward off death, I baked popovers, banana bread, cleaned the stove, the refrigerator, next, 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 the bathroom. Now we can look at history and reflect back its effects in moderation. Pandemic nature destroying human laws for our protection. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Linda said there's another Susan that wants to read. Uh, Linda, what is what is her name? I, I didn't get it. Down. Susanna. Susanna Rich and Susanna uh, Rich. Michael Anton also said he had a short piece. Okay, there's a lot of people. 
Okay. Okay. okay I'm going to put my timer on. <laughs> my phantom of the Facebook. Do you sit in your basement wearing only fruit of the loom briefs and rubber thongs, surrounded by apples and Dells and HPs, scrolling in the night each night, every night through my Facebook feed, your face up against my wall, riding my posts, relishing my shares, like when a William Shakespeare got the second British COVID inoculation and I wrote, hotel, hotel, the taming of the flu. Do you agree the game time that says, Susanna, you look 21 years old, or the one that raves, you are one sexy hot mama. You haven't liked, parted, wowed, wept, or grumbled any of my threads. Never wished me happy birthday or congrats or gift me. Is it because you want my weight for you to be more delicious? Do you live by what Emily Dickinson said, no is the wildest word? Do you watch my profile for relationship changes, movies I watch, my in general status? Are you the one who sends me friend requests under so many different names? Never would share friends with no selfie or cover photo, so it can be just entre nous. Is it because you don't want to share me? Oh, how romantic, how lurky. Oh, my phantom, have you lost faith and face both that you can't show me who you are? Even here now, can't you hear me sing? We certainly can hear you. You have a lovely voice. Thank you. Now a short poem from Anik Van Prague. Anna? Anna? With myself. Okay, hold on one sec. I um it's called the finger legs. My dog stares at the lake and sees. I messaged him the beauty of the water. Wait, he messaged me. Like a smooth smoke mirror, clouds enjoying swimming, slowly tracking by, playing with the waves. All is forgotten for a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Coming up now for an, another poem is Dig Wayne. Okay, this one's called Thin Air and Grace. Once they hemorrhage, we tourniquet our dreams with emotional spackle foreclosing on our mortgaged investments in life, staunching the flow of disappointment with bright colors, dust-free second floor window sills, rewrites, edits, divorces, fatal hangnails, sitting in anonymous meetings, wondering how everything collapsed from under us while we rabbit hole our past in search of who's to blame for ourselves, lowering the boom on mommy and daddy because they picked the low hanging fruit for you to gag and grow tall on while flowering in your thorny youth. A competition of tumultuous rumblings, hard-headed discipline, flat-footed untruths, and bloody bedtime lullabies. Eating sugary snacks of hurt, smiling with the face of a frown. Thank you. Thank you. One more poem from Carrie Trotman. Okay, so this poem was just published in the latest issue of Mock Turtle Zine, which is out of Dayton, Ohio, it just came out yesterday. So this is called Horse Clay. Our friend's Florida guest room had been their nursery, wallpapered in split rail fences and horses of every color, like her back home, Kentucky. They made it look easy to gallop away. Day long, our friends led us to water, flies caught in hair, eyeing gators with scents to slink from airboats. We eat from shells like inlanders, wander Thomas Edison's summer home. Your legs stride further than mine, even when headed to the same place. 2 a.m., I straddle you like a hobby horse, shush, shush, rocking slow, steady friction enough, but avoiding bed frame creaks, like the difference between an electric arc and a sinus rhythm. Horses leap fences in dark, manes moonbrushed in vertical blind stripes. I blink apology for not being newborn here in this grown-up feather bed. Black eyes startled, 
staring, the way the seminal must nightmare strings of plastic flamingo lights along patio overhangs and sequin bikini tops in the sea oaks. One day they will strip the wallpaper. The horse's legs and the Everglade runs will be over. Beachside daiquiri bars sparked dark in no longer named hurricanes. And my thighs will cramp when I try to hold my weight high above you. Thanks. Excellent poem. You, you painted, you made a great painting with, with your words. Um, you. Michael Anton wants to read now. Michael, it's time for you. Thank you. Um, this is Who You Gonna Believe. It happened a number of years ago at my friend Jonah's surprise 50th birthday party thrown by his wife, Randy, at an Indian restaurant in the West Village. You know you're getting old when you can combine a number of years ago and a friend's 50th birthday party in one sentence. The most beautiful woman at the table was Beata, so flawless that I wondered if surgical enhancement wasn't involved, but as she was a married woman with husband present, I was never going to know. Beata was born and raised in Poland. Her English was fluent with a slight and charming trace of an accent. She worked as a lawyer for a Wall Street bank, so clearly a person of some intellectual heft. At a certain point in the evening, the topic of conversation turned, as it so often does, to socialism. Without being in any way rude or unkind, Beata stated that I didn't know what I was talking about. She had lived in a socialist country and knew that it didn't work. So the question must be asked, whose opinion of socialism should carry greater weight? Someone with real life, firsthand experience of having lived in a socialist country or someone with a romantic, idealized view of it? Reasonable people would say the latter. Thank you. Thank you. We have a request for another poem by Noah Levin. Thank you all. This is called Gotta Eat Something, Might As Well Be You. Your, lackada your lackadaisical conversation was slowly penetrating my brain. Talk, 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 background, stale chatter, white noise about the weather and so and so and who and what, up-tempo, socially acceptable blither. Don't you see, he and she, can you believe? Mindless thoughts tedium, water tapping, slowly drilling my skull. A sudden light in the static, a thought occurs. Biscuits and gravy are lovely indeed, but I think your thoughts need a little spice. A little garlic, some cumin perchance. Slice the onion and put it in the roast. Your thoughts are droll, my dear, but they're oh so savory at 400 degrees. You've gotten your wish now, my darling. You're the center dish, the bell of the ball. Your scent is intoxicating. Your dribble has been basted and you're being marinated. We all gathered around, just like you always dreamed. You're the talk of the town. I've picked my teeth now with your thoughts and my belly is oh so full. I'm a lover of glutton and I've gorged on enough of your chatter for today. Thank you all. Thank you, we did some a little bit of a round robin. I have a request, now I wasn't there between two and four. If possible, that Linda Kleinbub can read a poem and the lovely Madeline Ottenberg can read a poem for me the current host who will soon be leaving. I'll read a poem, since you asked, from one of my little books. Um, these are, um, if you'd like a copy of these little books, it's one sheet of paper. I give them out to, for free when I, when I do things. So um, I'll read um, an oldie but a good one. This is called um, Stumbling. Thorns, thistle, be careful, baby, that's her heart. Soft, wet, fragile. He looks at her wanting to eat her up. She looks delicious, doesn't she? Vulnerable antique lace disintegrates easily. His glass shards invisible, fierce her skin, even through the clothes she wears. The swallows will still fly over the blackberry bushes, up into the maples. She's just a girl with tears in her belly, digging in topsoil, planting deception, linking memoir to history. Jousting heart, only she understands this devastation. Newly slashed, her skin pours poison, oily, dark, staining sheets, infiltrating purity. Never play games with ornamental lovers. Thanks a lot. 
Thank you for, for honoring me with that poem. Can I be honored by Madeline Ottenberg? Could you give me a poem, please? Absolutely. Um, but what I wanted to say first is, isn't Josh a wonderful host? And I want to thank all the hosts that jumped in. We created this event in two weeks. Linda, I, Josh, Matthew Hubert, and Roxanne Hoffman. And I'm so happy that we're making people happy. And I'm and happy. We, we couldn't do it without every single one of you here because exactly. it would be just five of us in a Zoom room and it wouldn't be anything. So thank <laughs> you, everybody, for being here. Absolutely. I'm going to read the poem that I read before because it, there's an important point about it that I had ignored Facebook until the pandemic. And then I started connecting with people, which has been a joy. And I also started sub submitting online because I, I sort of dismissed that before. So this was nominated by the Rainbow Project, Poets Wear Prada for Best of the Net 2020. And this is the blind man and poet. He'd never seen a woman. Sight is one color in her palette. The way she says his name sounds like seersucker, terry cloth, old blues. They question what is green, verde, bare. It's cucumber, she says. Envy's green, he says. He removes her fine silk blouse, she closes her eyes. When he slides fingers down her silky arm, each inch announces itself. He traces the rest of her outline, hangs it on his mind. Their breathing's bumpy now, they empty, smell like cucumbers, like new beginnings. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. And Madeline, and certainly this whole event is the premise of new beginnings. I'm going to uh, make Matthew the host, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to walk out. I'm looking for Matthew on the screen and I'll make him the host. <laughs> 